Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are on Season 7, Episode 7, Once More Into the Breach. This episode aired 11-11-1998. Before we talk about this one, anything to say about last week's episode? Treachery, Faith, and the Great River? I felt bad for Wayun 6. Well, yeah, <laughs> things didn't go well for him. Yeah. It was a good episode, but for some reason, I just didn't connect to it. I don't no, know. I, I noticed that. I didn't find a lot of depth in it or something. Yeah. Again, I, I enjoyed it, but I just had very little analysis of it. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a great episode. And, yeah, I know you did. And it did allow me to finally talk to you about where the water came from and their history. Yeah, that's true. There was some good info in it that I've been waiting for. Do we want to talk about this great Klingon episode? Absolutely. I might be giving away my feelings about it there. Mm, I'm going to hold on to mine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I might surprise you. Well, we open in Quarks where Julian and Miles continue to discuss the Alamo for some reason I cannot understand. Oh, that's because they got the hollow program for the Battle of the Alamo like last week or the week before. I know, but... We just keep talking about it. Even Worf is tired of the discussion, and he makes some comment about believing the legend of Davy Crockett or accepting that he was just some dude, and then he vacates to return to his quarters and get away from these two clowns. <laughs> Did you notice at 103, Morn teleports into the scene? <laughs> no. Was he not there before, and then suddenly he appeared? Oh, funny. If you watch the scene from the start, when the camera yeah. pans all the way to the right and you can see Miles mm -hmm. and Julian and then when Worf's talking and it cuts back to them, there is no way Morn is sitting at the bar. <laughs> and then when Worf stands up and walks, all of a sudden <laughs> Morn is at the bar. So I assume either... Oh, that's funny. He teleported in somehow sure. or he's just very sneaky. Well, they have the technology, yeah. so he could have beamed in, although I feel like we would have heard it. Right. Yeah. Well, now over to Worf's quarters and the doorbell rings and we see our old friend, Kor. Yes. And he looks amazing. Costume, <laughs> hair, I mean, amazing. For a Klingon in his mid-140s, he looks pretty good. <laughs> he does. Worf offers him a drink, and Kor says he heard about Jadzia. And Worf says she died a warrior, and Kor replies, I expected nothing less. She's held the sword of Kalos. All three of them. I can't tell you how much I'm obsessed with the sword of Kalos. I know. This is a great moment between the two of them. I, I just really like that yeah. little part of the scene. They have a little toast of blood wine, and we learn that the war isn't going well for Kor. His services don't appear to be needed or wanted anywhere. And Kor says it's because he's made enemies and he has no influence left in the Empire. He's come to Worf to beg for help. He has nowhere else to turn. He asks Worf to help him fight again and end his life the way he lived it, as a warrior. I guess this is where you run into the problem. For older Klingons, yeah. of all their friends die or are killed in battle. So if you're someone like Kor, who is a Dahar master and obviously is a great warrior, the chances of you ending up really being on your own and not having any friends. And I think worse yeah. for someone like Kor, and we see this in the episode, he gets forgotten. The younger yeah. generation aren't keeping up with his noble battles and the things he's done. Yes. There's some hero worship and they know the name, but they don't know the specifics. Yeah. Yeah. There's really no glory in old age for Klingons. Yeah. yeah. They become useless pretty fast. It's sad, really. I really thought this was a great scene. So well acted by John Kalikos, who yeah. plays Kor, but also Michael Dorn. I mean, you can really feel Kor's sense of dishonor in his age through his performance. I was just really impressed with this opening scene. Yes. I also got from it that there was a sense of regret with Kor, where he says that, you know, he's made too many enemies. And I got a sense that as an old man, he's looking back and saying, maybe I shouldn't have been that arrogant or shouldn't have been that harsh on my officers. Well, I think we're going to talk about this again in this episode. Yeah. Then we go to Martog, who is complaining about <laughs> filling out reports for the Federation, which was his original gripe about taking this job. He's got an older Klingon named Durak as his aide, trying to get his signature on repair orders. <laughs> Durak is great. Neither seem thrilled with the work. <laughs> and Martog dismisses him immediately when Worf enters. Oh, come on. This interaction was great. Durak is clearly not intimidated by 
Martog and certainly isn't swayed no. by his bluster and his position. Right. I mean, Martog even says to him, he'll be happy when he's no longer in his service. And Darek replies with, I look forward to that day with anticipation. <laughs> awesome. I mean, this is another example of where an older Klingon needs something to do. Yeah. And Martog has little or no respect for this guy, at least right. for the work that he's doing. And he just finds him an irritation. Yeah. And I mean, how humiliating. Who knows? This guy probably had a great life and now he's doing this job and neither one of them want him there. You know, want, he doesn't want to be there and Martek doesn't want him there. It might be a jump ahead, but it sounds like he is a noble Klingon. And you're right. It is like, what do you do with these older, experienced Klingons? And he ends mm -hmm. up basically being the paperwork guy. I mean, it's kind of similar in real life. Martog also seems upset that Cisco won't allow summary executions. Yeah, see, he's threatening. I don't know. <laughs> but it's not treating these old guys very well. But the flip side is Duroc is just not frightened by this. He's not intimidated. No, he's no, not fussed at all. I saw that the actor who plays Duroc, Neil C. Vipond, he passed away not that long ago at the oh. age of 92. Oh, wow. Whereas the guy who plays Kor died less than two years after this episode aired. That was a loss. Yeah. Well, back to the scene. Worf tells Martog about Kor, and Martog is immediately annoyed, saying, tell me you aren't going to ask me to give that man a ship. He says Kor is not welcome in his house or in his fleet. Worf calls Kor a friend, but Martog basically tells him to shut up and tells Worf to leave, which he does. Wow. It did not go the way Worf had planned, and we cue the theme song. Yeah, that was a little bit of an extreme reaction. I mean, he even says, don't make me forget we are brothers. Yeah, he was not happy. Hertzler was in full Martog mode here. Oh, yeah, in this whole episode. Yeah. In every scene in this episode, yeah. That was a fantastic piece of the loud Klingon, the public Klingon, the Klingon making at a point side of, yes. of these characters. What's great... Agreed. Maybe this is jumping ahead. What's great in this episode is we see both sides of the Klingon culture really clearly in this one. We see several scenes where the Klingons are doing that I'm the biggest dude in the room. I'm the loudest guy. I'm going to yeah. shout and you know, make my name heard, kind of Klingon. And then at the opposite side, we see the Klingon behind closed doors with their friends and their family talking calmly, talking about the things that matter to them. And it's a wonderful 180 between the two facets that really make up this race. Also helped by the fact that everybody in this episode gets it. <laughs> yes, that's true. Now we go to Cisco's office, and Martog is describing his upcoming attack plans. Cisco thinks he's being too ambitious, but Martog's plan isn't to destroy the facilities he's attacking. He plans instead to damage them and throw them off balance. He thinks being behind their lines will cause chaos. Cisco compares it to a cavalry raid, and it's a lot of manly talk and slapping each other on the shoulder. These two might be in love, I'm not sure. It's a mutual admiration society. <laughs> Can I do a post-it note here? Uh-oh. Something about the cavalry is wrong. Watch out, people. Well, given the ability and the range for cavalry to travel, I'd liken this more to the British SAS in the desert campaign in North Africa during World War II, which were designed to go quite deeply behind enemy lines and attack infrastructure, airfields, supply depots, things like that. It's much more, I would say, analogous to that type of uh, small mobile units that can attack specific value targets rather than just the cavalry getting behind the enemy lines. But did they have a cloaking device? They did not. Actually, cavalry nor the SAS had cloaking devices. Okay. Before we leave the scene, though, I was wondering about Cisco's reaction and behavior to this thing. Is he building up political capital with Martog? He doesn't seem all on board with that. He describes it as a little ambitious, but he realizes that Martog's going to do this anyway. So, oh, for sure. So, being the politician, having that skill, Cisco's going to come at this as I'm going to put on a good face and go along with Martog because it will basically improve my standing with Martog. That I can put this in the bank and use it later when I need to tell Martog, no, don't do something stupid. And say, look, I approved that mission you did before because it was a good idea. This next one you want to do at some other point, don't do it. Trust me on this. Do you think Cisco needs to approve what Martog does? 
I think Cisco could object. He could. And it might cause, it might end up going up the line and Martog being told maybe by the Klingon High Command or saying, look, you won't get Federation support with this. And the Klingons have been forced to back down, which would be arguably a humiliation for Martog. It runs the risk. Hmm. If he didn't, I would argue then he probably wouldn't tell Cisco or wouldn't ask for the defiant to be nearby on Federation support. Right. It's a good question. You might be giving Cisco a little bit more credit here than he deserves, but I mean, it makes sense. You would have to learn how to work with all of the different races. Yeah. And we've seen Cisco adapt to talk to the Romulans. Right. So why not? Why wouldn't he adapt to talk to the Klingons? And I do think you're right that Martug's going to do this. So Cisco doesn't say, wow, that's a terrible idea. He just says, well, it seems a bit ambitious. <laughs> that's all he says. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, haha, we're great friends. So yeah, you could be right. Now we go to the Chetang. I'm not sure why we're not on the Ritaran. I don't know what happened to Martog's ship, but we're on the Chetang. And Martog is getting a list of repairs when he sees Worf kind of moping around the bridge. When Worf brings up Kor again, Martog shouts, clear the bridge. And Worf says, <laughs> bellows, I think would be a better description. <laughs> okay, yes. Worf says he never expected to not be allowed to speak. And this softens Martog a bit, at least enough to at least listen to Worf. Yes. Who says, Kor is an old man who just wants a chance to fight and die for the Empire. Yeah. Martok says he would not give that man the gnawed bones of his last meal. <laughs> Worf wonders why, since they haven't even met. Uh -oh. And Martok then launches into a story about his childhood, where he explains that his family didn't have much, but 15 generations of his family had served as soldiers. Martok's father had high hopes that Martok would become an officer. After a great deal of effort, he was sponsored and passed his entrance exam, I guess into an officer program yeah. or something. But Kor was on the Oversight Council and denied Martog's entrance. Kor's family descends from the Imperial Court itself, right. while Martog was from the Lowlands. Yeah. And apparently not worthy of joining the officer ranks, at least according to Kor. Wow. The aristocracy reserving the high positions as they see them for members of the aristocracy. Sounds so familiar. With the mark of Kor in his record, Martog couldn't even join as a common soldier. Wow. So he spent five years as a civilian laborer on a ship where he eventually managed to earn a battlefield commission. Unfortunately, his father didn't live to see that day. That's the bit that really annoys him. Yep. Worf understands and says he used his own authority already to appoint Kor as an officer in the fleet. That stings Martog, who says he was made an officer just like that. Relying on his privilege again. Worf begins to apologize and explain, but... I really loved it here when Martok says, your apology is not sought, but know this, Worf, Kor is your responsibility. Yeah. And then he dramatically leaves. Oh, I just, I love the drama of the Klingons. Oh, it's just completely. so good. Yeah. What I loved here again is we saw that initially Martog has that bluster and that the we, we're not going to talk about this. Yeah. And then Worf, when he stands up to him, Martog reverts to, look, these are the reasons, and has a much more reasonable conversation. As a member of his house, he deserves to know. Yeah, I can certainly see Martog's point. I do like Martog's leadership here. He doesn't ask for Worf's apology. He trusts Worf. He trusts his first officer. He says, yeah, this is your problem to look after, but he doesn't, yeah. he doesn't try to undermine Worf's authority or Worf's decision. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I have a little more about that in my overanalysis, oh, actually. excellent. Now we go to Kor chatting with Ezri and reminiscing about Kurzan. Ezri excuses herself when Worf appears. And Kor says to Worf, still the same old Dax. And yet, not. <laughs> Which I thought was really good. I think that's the whole point. Yeah. Worf tells Kor the story of what he did to Martog, but Kor has no memory of it, of course. He's like, did I? Oh, when Worf criticizes what he did, Kor doubles down, saying, we come from noble houses, and that still counts for something. It would have been wrong, though, for the character of Kor for him to do anything else other than double down. Oh, completely. Yeah. This is a huge part of Kor. Yeah. Kor is the old guard of the old guard. Kor is the epitome of young kids today. They don't understand what the world's really like in my day. Yeah. That sense of 
the aristocracy and entitlement and the sort of the bloodline. It's so critical to Core. It's great to see this character, but it's also kind of sad to see him so tied up in prejudices. The concepts of basically monarchy <laughs> and the, yeah, the prejudice of the landed class, the noble aristocracy. Worf says Martug will not give Kor a command. Instead, he will serve as third officer on the Chitang. Kor kind of scoffs, but he thanks Worf, and Worf tells him when to report to his new ship and says to stay out of Martog's way. <laughs> and Kor says plan. he won't even know I'm there. Oh, dear. But as Worf is leaving, Kor asks for the name of the ship again. Oh. And then he's like, oh, yeah, of course, the Chitang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Oh. So we get the first sign of trouble. Yeah. That Kor couldn't remember the name of the ship that he'd just been told. I think I would have forgotten in that moment, too. <laughs> Do you think that's also an indication of why he couldn't remember nixing Martog's application? No, I think that the point more of that was that he did that without thinking. And he probably did that yeah. a bunch of times. That, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. How many times has he done this? How many great officers, commanders, Klingon leaders have been passed over by people like him who are like, oh, they're from the wrong class. Well, they're not our kind of people. Look, this is what's been happening to women forever. They get passed over because they're women, not because they don't deserve it, but because they're women. And it, this is the same nonsense. It's like, oh, he, he doesn't descend from the right people. It's just like, come yeah. on. He's not even in line to the throne. How good could he be? God, yeah. Oh, this is, an, this is another great scene. I, I just loved Core in this scene. Yeah. Now we go to an excellent overhead shot of the five Klingon birds of prey departing the station. Love the space scenes. And we go to the red smoky bridge of the Chetang. Martok <laughs> is giving orders when Kor reports for duty. I mean, surely we could have put him on one of the other ships if we didn't want Martok to be bothered by him. I don't understand why we put him on the ship with Martok. I guess maybe because Wolf was going to keep an eye on him. I guess. Everyone but Martok is immediately impressed by the presence of the Dahar Master. Oh, was it the tactical officer or the helm who, when he walks onto the bridge, just yeah. reverently whispers? She's like, oh, a Dahar master. Yeah. This is someone who is the very living definition of a their legend. reputation preceding them. Yeah. Worf tells him to take his station and everyone watches him in awe. Martog yells at them all to snap them out of it. <laughs> Dirac is particularly in awe of Kor, which really annoys Martog. Oh, yeah. Everyone shakes Kor's hand and slaps him on the shoulder, and Martog just sighs. Oh, yeah, when Dirac says, Kor, here, on our ship. <laughs> yeah, if Martog had two eyes, he'd have been rolling them. <laughs> yes. Well, you also get Martog asking him, don't you have something to do? <laughs> and Dirac just will say, no. No. <laughs> oh, my God. There is so much worship of Kor here. It's kind of funny. And the funny thing is they're also serving under an amazing Klingon, you know? Right, right. But I guess Martag hasn't reached legendary status yet. Well, we've seen how the stories get larger and yes, larger of over course. time. And Martag needs somebody to make those stories bigger. Yeah. But, you know, maybe he's not that type. He's not the core type of Klingon, which is mostly bluster and story. Yeah. I mean, obviously effective. Yeah. But the stories are larger than what, yeah, what reality was. Plus the retelling of the stories. You know, the four yeah. Romulan guards who were overpowered when they were going somewhere turned into, well, it was 40 guards to <laughs> Kor alone slaughtered 40 well-armed Romulans to get through yes. the, the gateway. And you could see that being built up. So maybe that's another point that the younger generation who have heard these stories or have heard of the legend will have heard the legend in the extreme. Right. Yeah. Now we go to Kira and Esri chatting in Quarks. Esri says she keeps having the same conversation over and over where everyone is shocked at first to meet her and then they look her up and down <laughs> and compare her to, to Jadzia. Kira is sure this is just an adjustment period. Esri agrees, saying Kira would make a good counselor, which Kira finds very funny. <laughs> she says she'd just tell people they were crazy, which I, I totally believe that's what she would do. There's a lot of things I think Kira would be excellent at, but maybe <laughs> as a counselor, probably not. Yeah, that's not for her. Esri says since talking to Kor, she's been dreaming about being on a Klingon ship and going off into battle. 
And Quark approaches and eavesdrops part of the conversation, thinking that she's talking about Worf, not Kor. <laughs> yes. Back at the bar, Quark tells Odo that Esri wants to get back together with Worf. I really like how they've written Esri. Again, leveraging those memories, completely unlike Jadzia. She seems much more comfortable talking about the previous experiences, like with Kira, and she does it a lot. Okay, headcanon here. The Trill Institute of Superior Joined Trills <laughs> actually discourages the joined from using their memories and talking about them for some reason. And because Esri hasn't been indoctrinated yeah. and wasn't forced to follow all their probably very petty rules, she's just rolling with this. Esri is how joined trills are supposed to be and react and behave. I think that's very good headcanon. I was thinking maybe she's different because the show has evolved and the way they look at trills, <laughs> yeah. the way they write trills has evolved. But, but I think what you say makes sense because they've made a point of telling us she didn't go through the program. Right. So, of course, she would do it differently. Just the fact that she's here, I think, you know, that she's returned to this place that was comfortable to her. Just yeah. that alone is different from what they're trained to do. I like that. Now we go back to the Klingon ship and Martag is telling tales of battle to the crew in the mess hall. When Kor comes in, everyone immediately starts fawning over him instead. Worf tries to interrupt Martog from having a meltdown by asking about the upcoming attack plan. When he describes it, it's two ships going first to cause damage and then head out of the system. And then when the repair crews come out, the other ships decloak and attack. Unfortunately, Kor speaks up here saying, it's an excellent plan. And the same tactic that he and Kang used against the Federation oh. at Caleb 4. Everyone continues to fawn over him, which irritates Martog, and he leaves in a huff. Well, it causes Kor to launch into one of his stories. And again, yeah. you see how Kor is a great storyteller. These, mm -hmm. these are a captive audience. They already respect him. So when he begins the story of how he learned how the cloaking device worked and begins the tale, all of them right. are just enraptured. Lots of hero worship. Yeah, because he says something about the cloaking devices were brand new at that time, which would have been a long time ago, and yeah. they all sort of laugh. But yeah, that was that was cool. I think as well, it shows how important the spoken narrative and the storytelling is within Klingon culture. Yeah, for sure. Later, Worf is trying to placate Martog by saying the crew isn't used to serving with a legend, which is why Kor is so popular. They get a call that they're approaching the target, and they head to the bridge as an announcement calls for battle stations. And now we see Kor in a hallway, looking confused. Oh. But when he runs into someone else heading to the bridge, he snaps back to his senses, and he tells himself to concentrate. Oh, it's where he's standing there and says, I'm supposed to be somewhere. Supposed to be doing something, yeah. Oh. I mean, we do that all the time. <laughs> it was oddly hard to watch. Hmm. I think because between my initially watching this and mm -hmm. later life, having experienced someone going through cognitive decline, it puts a different spin on it. It seems more real. Oh, yeah, of course. And I think the portrayal is actually shockingly good. Now we see the two ships attacking the target successfully as planned. Klingon's causing trouble. The shields are down to 65% and the two ships take off, but one of the ships is destroyed by a Cardassian ship before it can escape. When Martog sees the base is unprotected, the other ships head in. When the repair crews come out and the shields are dropped, the three Klingon ships decloak and attack. Martog orders torpedoes to be fired and an escape course laid in. But their ship is hit repeatedly until both Worf and Martog go down. Yes, Martog gets knocked to the floor. And Worf is completely out. Yeah. Kor sees this and steps in, giving orders to keep firing, although that was not the plan. He calls for another pass while Martog struggles from the floor to say no, but it's too late. The crew takes the order and takes a lot of hits. Yeah, they're getting plastered and nobody can hear Martog over the noise. Yeah, from the floor, he's like sort of croaking, yeah. leave the system. And he calls Kor an old fool, but they keep listening to him. Kor shouts for the other ships, though damaged, to keep firing. And then he says, open a channel to Kang. Uh-oh. Yeah. He's flashed back to an old battle as the Chitang is getting pummeled and the crew is baffled about what to do. Yeah, he thinks he's in the old battle of Caleb 4. Yep. Finally, Martog shouts, get us out of here, as Worf stumbles to his feet and sees Martog about to throw a dagger at Kor's head, who is ranting about destroying the Federation. And landing troops. Yes. 
Worf steps in just in time, catching the dagger before it hits Kor in the head. He knocks Kor down and calls for the other ships to take off. They engage the cloaks and escape. Martok has made it back into the captain's chair, and he orders them to proceed to the rendezvous point. Worf calls for a medical team to the bridge. I don't think I've ever heard that on a Klingon (laughs) ship before. I don't think we've ever seen a Klingon doctor. Well, I think this is Worf's Federation influence here. Oh, maybe (laughs) he forgot where he was. It's the first Klingon (laughs) ship to actually have a medical team. Well, he got hit in the head, and so he maybe thinks he's on the Enterprise. Remember, culturally... Klingons don't believe in preserving the suffering of warriors. And that's true. Well, Martug orders Worf to get Kor off the bridge, but Kor leaves on his own, pretty dejected yeah. and confused, I would say. Right. Back to Quark's, and Ezri approaches the bar, and Quark <laughs> says he needs to tell her something, and he says she shouldn't pursue a relationship with Worf. He says Worf hasn't done anything to deserve her. She deserves better. Ezri finds this cute, saying she wasn't planning on having another relationship with Worf. But she says Quark is being kind and calls him a sweetheart. And Quark goes to get her drink, which is a Moscow mule, by the way, and tells Jake that clearly Ezri loves him because she called him (laughs) sweetheart. Like, what she really did was say a sweetheart. That's different. And Jake is like, yeah, sure, she loves you. Quark hears what he wants to hear in this situation. But ultimately, wouldn't this be Ezri's decision and it's got nothing to do with Quark? Yes, of course. But we don't really like to give women the power of decision. Ah, okay. Agency over their own bodies. We don't, we're not, we're not in favor of that. That'll just lead to trouble. (laughs) Back on the Chitang and Kor is eating by himself in the mess hall when Martog and a few others come in. Martog takes this opportunity to mock Kor. Oh. Durak tries to leave, but Martog doesn't let him go. They make fun of Kor for being confused. And finally, Kor stands up and says, savor the fruit of life, my young friends. It has a sweet taste when it is fresh from the vine, but don't live too long. The taste turns bitter after time. Ugh. They were being really mocking. Oh, it was bad. And then he leaves, and Martog knocks his plate to the floor violently. I mean, how amazing was this scene? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Between Martog taunting him... The speech from Kor and then Martog's frustration about really not getting any satisfaction out of what he just did. It was yeah. so good. I and mean, Kor doesn't rise to the bait. He does he doesn't not. defend himself. No. Nope. The gloss has come off for the, I think it was the tactical officer and the helm that were there. And both of those were joining in and they were in reverence to this yeah. guy. Two women, by the way, in the crew. So clearly it's quite the fall from grace. Yep. But I imagine at this point, Kor is used to this. This isn't news to him. Yeah. So he's just, you know, he's just dealing with it. Right. Worf later finds Martog in his office or ready room or wherever this is, and he presents the new personnel roster. Martog knows it was difficult to remove his friend from active duty, but Worf realizes he shouldn't have put Kor into that position in the first place. Martog says he's hated that name for 20 years and dreamt of the moment he'd finally see him stripped of rank and title without the power of his birthright. Yeah. But now that he's had the moment, he took no joy from it. Martog finds revenge is not the dish best served cold. Worf says when the mission is over, he intends to talk to Gauron and find an assignment for Kor on the homeworld. Martog agrees that he'll talk to Gauron as well. That's a big change for Martog. Just then, they're called to the bridge as sensors have detected a large group of Jem'Hadar fighters approaching. I really liked here how, in the end, even Martok says he'll talk to Gowron. They'll find something for Kor to do. It really, I thought, was such a turnaround. Of I think what wanted to happen was Martok wanted to humiliate, defeat Kor in his prime. Yep. Kor the warrior. Yeah. But this, it's picking this on an old it. guy who's so past his prime. Yeah. And the difference is... We've had this in other shows, and you and I have talked about this in other episodes, where they've sort of made fun of aging. It happened in at least one episode with the Grand Nagus. And the difference is here, this character recognizes that the taste of that humor was not sweet. Yeah. Sometimes a show, we talk about whiplash on the show, right? Where (laughs) we go from A to Z in half of a second or less. And that's, to me, like what's happened here is... 
This is an example of how to treat this appropriately, where we see the bad behavior, but we also see the consequences of it instead of just making fun of it. And I think it speaks to the character of Martog. It does. That he sees his mistake and he's prepared to do something to rectify it because there is no revenge. The man he wanted to take revenge on is long gone. Yeah, I agree. We learn the enemy ships are using some sort of long-range tachyon scanner to track them while they're cloaked. They're surprised the Dominion is able to do this. I think we're all surprised that anyone can do this. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they've kind of been able to detect cloaks before. Yeah, but not from a distance. Yeah. Right? I guess this is coming down to it's the arms race between cloaking technology and detection technology. And scanning, Yeah. yeah. There are 10 ships pursuing them, and they'll be within weapons range before they rendezvous with the Defiant and seven other Federation ships. Yep. Worf says if they could force the Jem'Hadar ships to drop out of warp for a few minutes, they'd be able to get away. He suggests they disrupt their warp fields with an inverse graviton burst, forcing them to drop to impulse. A single bird of prey could do it if all power was diverted to the deflector. And then Worf says he could engage them in battle, delaying them long enough for the remaining ships to escape. I love Worf is immediately ready to do this. He's ready to go into battle. Absolutely. Worf volunteers to take one of the other ships, saying he is the logical choice. In the background, we see Durak eavesdropping. Worf says he could do it with only six other volunteers on this suicide mission. Martog begrudgingly agrees. I don't think the Klingons have a concept of a suicide mission. (laughs) I think it's just a glorious battle against insurmountable odds. Well, yeah, I have a question about that in my overanalysis, actually. The other thing here is Mm -hmm. he wants six volunteers. I get the feeling that there would actually have to be a lottery on the ship. Mm, To pare it down to six? (laughs) Because every single person would volunteer. Yeah. I think the concept of a warrior's death alongside a legend, they're hoping for a whole opera about this. Mm. Durak enters Kor's quarters and finds him lying down and pouting. Dirac says he misses the simplicity of the old days, calling the crew children, forgetting the glory of the past. Eventually, he tells Kor of the plan, (laughs) handing a pad with the details to him. So basically, this is two boomers complaining about millennials. Yes. I guarantee these two look at some time period in the past as the golden age. Oh, 100%. Durak says it's a good plan, but it has a flaw. It depends on Worf successfully engaging the entire enemy fleet in battle. Kor says it can be done by confusing their sensors with a spray of torpedoes right at the start. Durak says perhaps, but it would take more experience than Worf has to accomplish such a feat. Kor is suddenly very excited by the prospect of this mission. Durak's work here is done. He tells Kor it's been an honor serving with him and leaves. So what was Durak's motivation here? Oh, his motivation was to give this mission to Kor, exactly what happened. Yeah. He knows that Kor is looking for a way to go out in a glorious death. He knows that. Yeah. Because I think he probably knew it immediately when he was on the bridge. Right. Because they showed him eavesdropping in the previous scene, so he heard the plan. Yeah. So he purposely took that and was talking about it to Kor and was trying to goad him, because he, like I said, he was pouting at the beginning of the scene. He's trying to goad him into this. So I think he got exactly what he was hoping for. The bit I'm not sure on is what the ultimate goal was. Was he wanting a legend to die as a legend? Mm. Or was this more self-serving as in, I want to live, so I want the guy most technically capable of carrying out this mission? Well, it might not have been that self-serving. It might have just been, hey, I believe a Dahar master would be good at this. I mean, what he said may have been true. He may have really felt like Worf wasn't experiencing it. Look, Worf's not even the captain. That's true. He has commanded the Defiant. But then again, that is a Federation ship. Yeah, exactly. Not with this guy. So it is entirely possible that what he's saying is what he means, which is just that Worf just doesn't have enough experience to do this. It's a good idea. But the flaw in the plan is he's not done it before. So, you know, I don't know that he was there to, for self-preservation, Yeah. but he could have been just saying, hey, this mission will have better luck or we'll have a better chance of success yeah. if Kor is the one who leads it. That's possible. Yes. So you think it was more success related rather than just, I'm giving this legend a, an out? No, I think it's more that. I think it was more he was given the legend the opportunity to be the okay. legend. I do think that. Yeah. But I think it's possible it could have been the other as well. Okay. I thought it was sort of interesting that he didn't go along. Maybe he's resigned to his fate in a different way. Yeah. 
I think Duroc says earlier, when he's excused from working with Martok, I think mm -hmm. if you're a loyal Klingon and you have been given something to defend the Empire and you have honor, you're not going to give that up unless it's taken away from you. Hmm. So you would serve with honor, whatever the role is. Yeah, yeah. Well, then that makes sense. Well, now Kor approaches Worf in a quiet, dark hallway to wish him well. And he says, I look forward to seeing you at the gates of Stovall Kor. And then as Worf turns to leave, Kor hits him in the neck with a hypospray, knocking him out. <laughs> uh, yeah, asking if he has any message for Jadzia. Yes, to make him stop, yeah. Over Worf's unconscious body, Kor says, When I reach the halls of the hallowed dead, I will find your beloved and remind her that her husband is a noble warrior and that he still loves no one but her. And then he beams away, saying, Long live the Empire. Instead of, Today is a good day to die, which surprised me. Well, I think first, was that not just a fantastic scene? Amazing. Every time <laughs> they give John Calico's a, like, a poetic speech, he kills it. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Head cannon time. Long live the Empire. Because Kor did not think today was a good day to die. He was Kor. How could he possibly die? Oh, yeah, that's he a good point. He will win the battle win. for the glory of the Empire. Okay, okay. You make a good point. On the bridge, Durak gives a bottle of blood wine to Martog, who doesn't think booze belongs on the bridge. Which is a detail I absolutely <laughs> love. I mean, it's, we'll do anything else on the bridge. <laughs> yeah. And Duroc delivers a great line as well, saying, you can drink to their courage, and if they fail, you can still drink to their courage. That's the truth. Yeah. One of the crew members reports that Ning Tao is approaching the enemy and has initiated the Graviton Burst. The warp fields are destabilizing and all the ships have dropped out of warp. The Ning Tao engages the enemy and Martog bows his head and says, die well, Worf. But surprise, Worf enters saying, Today was not my day to die. <laughs> Martog realizes it's Kor on the other ship, but before he can get too mad, it appears that Kor has been successful. They're at the limits of their sensor range and lose contact with Kor's ship. Martog says, one ship against ten, it doesn't seem possible. But Worf says he will succeed. And later, when they realize the plan worked, Martog opens the blood wine and shouts, to Kor, a Dahar master and noble warrior to the end. And they start singing and passing the bottle around although Martog does not sing, which is interesting because if there were six other people on that ship, you could sing for them, even if you didn't like Kor. That's true. Yeah. The other, yeah, the other Klingons deserve a song in their honor. Yeah. The end. Wow. Every <laughs> Klingon episode ends with such drama. That was so good. Well, apparently, the song they're singing at the end is not actually Klingon. Oh, what were they singing? Was it from Hamilton? Apparently, it is just Klingon sounding words. Oh. <laughs> I read a whole thing about this online, and some folks have just done awesome headcanon. Okay. They've headcanoned this into it being basically a song in like ancient Klingon. Or it's that Italian guy who is just singing English words. <laughs> <laughs> a nonsense song. That's also a good point. But yeah, yeah they made it. It's an ancient Klingon dialect and they're singing it in its original form. And it would be like mm. how if you sung in an ancient European language that nobody knows today, it would sound incomprehensible. Mm. I was like, okay, okay. that's some quality head that's cannon. That's some good head there. cannon. Yeah, we, we respect that <laughs> on this podcast. Well, do you have over analysis? Yes, I do. And let's start off with. Yeah. Kor, at the beginning when he talks to Worf, specifically says, help me end my life as I've lived it, as a warrior. Right. Was Kor aware he was starting to suffer from some kind of cognitive decline? Yeah. Or was there another medical condition he didn't mention? No, I don't think so. I don't think there was another medical condition. I think just based on that speech that he gave about aging, Yeah. I think he has realized he's obsolete. In his old age, I mean, he says he doesn't have friends and that's why he can't get anywhere, but he probably deep down knows it's not just that. It's yeah. also that his skills have declined. And the last time we saw him, he's, he had a, still he had a pretty significant drinking problem. So even by then, you know, I think he'd lost a lot of his friends and right. a lot of his yeah. influence. So I didn't think there was another 
condition. I think he just realized he was past his prime. And if he didn't do something, he would get so far past, he wouldn't have an opportunity to die like a warrior, which is supposedly the thing the Klingons want. Right, right. You know me, I always think people are being genuine when they say things. (laughs) Oh, I think he was completely aware of his decline and that this literally was, like you said, the last chance. We all know that we're declining. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) You can keep kidding yourself, but... Next thing. Yeah. Klingon tactics. I do rather hope that the Cardassians or the Dominion have not been studying Klingon history if they're doing exactly the same thing that yeah. Kor and Kang were doing, I don't know, 70, 80 yeah. years in the past. The Cardassians are absolutely not studying anything because they're idiots and they think they're superior. So no reason to worry about them. Yeah, the Klingons are lesser, so how could they possibly yeah. outthink us? Forget it. They're studying nothing. Now, the Vorta may have studied. Yeah, so that would be the concern. Also, I think it's bad for the Klingons not to have studied old battles, especially for someone like Martog. Wouldn't you have wanted to review all the great Klingon warriors? Perhaps part of the problem is Klingon history is so legend (laughs) because they make the stories bigger. So you're reading Klingon history to get some idea of tactics or battle strategy, and it will be one warbird destroyed a thousand ships with a spread of photon torpedoes and you just read it and go what really happened yeah so it becomes hard to learn from your own history because it is so embellished and it's so by its very nature legend (laughs) that's a good point but i guess i was thinking he probably had read about this as a tactic and just liked the idea ah so I figured he did get that idea from somewhere yeah. else. I don't think he made it up, but I guess we they're not really super clear about that. Yeah. Sort of you're using the best tactics from your understanding mm-hmm. and learning. You're not necessarily making things up on the fly. Right. Gotcha. That's good headcanon too. Thank you. Next thing. Did Odo tell anyone about how you can destroy Jem Hadar ships with a single shot? You just need to get <laughs> up behind them and shoot through the weak part of the shield. He really needs to share that. There's 10 of them, so it would have been hard. There's four Klingon ships, one without a captain. Although, you're right. Why they wouldn't send Worf over to captain the one that didn't have a captain, I don't know. Yeah. We needed everybody on the same bridge. It was one warbird piloted by Kor. I mean, Mm. those are unfair odds against the Jem'Hadar. (laughs) If you add into that the ability to kill them with one shot, they're gone. Yeah. Well, sure. <laughs> so says the legend. That's what the legend is. Kor destroyed them all single-handedly with the oh, bridge on fire. Yeah, just when Martug said the line about how is one ship against ten even possible, you know this turned into a song and a giant legend. Yeah, <laughs> how he went out. Absolutely. Next thing. Yeah. So the Klingons have a class and aristocracy problem. Yeah, that was a surprise, wasn't it? I guess we've had hints at that because Martog's wife is of a noble house and Mm -hmm. was obsessed with maintaining the aura, even though I think Jadzia found the real history wasn't quite true. Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, it's tough to get away from prejudice. I mean, people always think they're better than somebody else for some stupid reason. Could this be why Kor did not like Gowron. Remember, he made a comment before of an enemy of Gowron as a friend of mine. Yeah, probably. I couldn't find any reference, and I I don't think I'd seen any references of Gowron being a noble house or from a noble family descended from the emperors. Mm. So that's what I was wondering. I think you're probably right. And I think that would be another thing that maybe was annoying to Worf, because Worf has this unite the Klingons, that, that they should come together and not squabble and infight. If this aristocracy and class is still a big part of Klingon society, Wolf's got his work cut out if he ever wanted to do that. <laughs> or wanted that to happen. Yeah. Next thing. And this is really an observation. So Wolf is the last living person to have held the sword of Kalos. <laughs> he is. <laughs> I might be slightly obsessed with that. You might be. But it's true. And my final point is, so did Kor defeat them all and survive? Is Kor <laughs> still alive? Uh, well, 
I'm guessing no, but it's part of the legend that we don't know. Oh. He's still swooping in to, yeah, to different places and attacking. The legend is he is still alive and behind Jem'Hadar lines and destroying bases at will. Yeah, I wonder if they left that open on purpose. Yeah. Not just for the story and the legend, but did they have thoughts that maybe they would bring him back at some point? Yeah. They killed Jadzia without a second thought, so. <laughs> a good point. And I think that wraps up my over-analysis. Over to you, Kim. Okay. I have three points. The first one is, I know someone is trying to make a connection to the Alamo and the story of Davy Crockett and what happened in this episode. I mean, they started yeah. with it, right? So I know that was the point, but I don't know what the connection is, and I don't care. <laughs> Tales, <laughs> Tales of the Wild West are not for me. Not a great time for women. Sounds like everyone is covered in dirt. I'm sure it smelled really bad. And there were snakes and dysentery. I mean, I played the Oregon Trail. I'm out. I don't care. I don't want to know. <laughs> I'm sure there was some connection there. Yeah. It was 100% lost on me. I think it was only an intro for Worf to deliver his line about how if you believe in the, the legend, legend, then yeah. the exact facts do not matter. And if you don't, yes. then it was just a guy. Yeah. Okay. My second point is, was the, the decision to send Worf and six others to, de to their death, was that the Klingon choice? I mean, it would save three other ships. It's not like it's going to save the whole empire. But why would they not choose to fight the Klingons? Well, that's a good point. Why wouldn't all of them turn around, emit the graviton pulse, and then fight it out? Because yeah. what's the worst that could happen? You die gloriously in battle. And also, couldn't Cisco and the other ships move towards them to shorten the gap? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, they're waiting for us at that location. If you came a little closer, then we yeah. could get to you sooner. You know, if you're both heading towards each other... It goes faster. I mean, that would make more sense if the Klingons were trying to delay so they could get the reinforcements and all of them could come and crush the Jem'Hadar. Yeah. I don't think the Klingons are stupid. That they wouldn't go, hey, we've got this group of ships that are almost with us. If we join together, we can absolutely, we can guarantee a victory. I think, you know, Worf said before, the best kind of honor is victory. Yeah, I assume that they were in enemy territory yeah. and that the other ships didn't want to cross, but... Go and help your friends. I questioned it all a little bit. Yeah. I certainly think the Defiant, which can cloak, would want to get in oh, on good that. good point. Yeah. Yeah. Especially now that they know the secret way to destroy the Jem'Hadar ship is just shoot him in that one spot. Has anybody read the memo from Odo? Oh, I hope so. But you're right. I, I would say the Klingons' first take to be how do we fight all of them at once and yeah. win. Yeah, they didn't even talk about that. I found that surprising. Okay, headcanon. In the Klingons' defense, yeah, yeah. perhaps the ships were significantly more damaged than they led on. Yeah, one of them didn't even have a captain or a first officer. Yeah. Yeah. And another one of them was quite damaged, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, they just can't fight. It's not that they didn't want to. It's like, we don't have any torpedoes left. The phases are gone. They physically weren't able to fight. Yeah, I think I have to accept that as the answer. And then my last point is about Kor versus Martog. Yes. We saw that Kor held on to his prejudices to the bitter end, basically. While we see Martog angry, yet he still listens to Worf, and he allows Kor on the bridge. So even the one who was wronged was still willing to support Worf. And this to me is just like adding to my devotion of Martog and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that he is the greatest Klingon in all of Star Trek. Well, I think it's all part of building Martog as a character. He is the more flexible Klingon, and he's not weighed down by the Klingon concepts of class and aristocracy. It's a great place for this character to be. He's the true Klingon warrior. Yes. You know, no matter what Kor has done, he has still probably hampered the Empire by having these prejudices. Oh, completely. How many officers did he uh, yes. pass over who would have been the greatest Klingon of all time? Exactly. What he's harmed, we don't know because it's yes. invisible. Right. But we can see the things that he has done. So that was my last point. So I'm going to go to women in the future. 
Martog is pretty freaking awesome. Uh, he is. Ezri's only story in this episode is that Quark is in love with her. <laughs> I mean, we just transferred Julian and Jedzia to Quark and Ezri. Who cares? Do better Star Trek. Oh my God. It's how are we still there? How have we gone back there? Yeah. Oh, that's annoying. It was good to see the women officers on the Klingon ship being treated just like any other warriors. The tactical and the helm, I think. Or was it science? I'm not sure. They never said. But I would say they were maybe a little bit incompetent. They knew the plan, and yet they still followed Kor's chaotic orders. Ah, I will defend them. There is a chain of command. Kor was still the third officer and a yeah. Dahar master. Yes, but... As far as they knew, the captain was disabled or could have been dead. Yeah. Because they couldn't hear him or anything. He's the ranking officer on the bridge. You are going to follow his orders if you're a good Klingon warrior. Yeah, I imagine that's the case, but also none of them pointed out that that wasn't the plan or that they had the escape route plotted in because that was the last thing that Martog said before he got hit. None of them spoke up. None of them did anything, but I get it. Yeah. The legend has taken control of the ship. You're going to listen to him. Right. Yeah. But my point, I guess, was that they were just like any officers on that bridge. And yeah. I thought that was pretty good. It's crazy that we see that within the Klingon ranks more than we see it <laughs> anywhere else. <laughs> All right. I feel like this has been a long episode, but let's go to rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or neutral. What is your rating? Absolute thumbs up. Probably one of the greatest Klingon episodes of all time. You got to see both sides of the Klingons, the bluff, the bluster, the bigger than life, the legends. And you got to see the quiet Klingons, how they talk to each other behind closed doors. Yeah. And you got to see some top-notch Klingon acting from three actors who absolutely get it. And the supporting cast all were beautifully Klingon. So. What else can I give it than two thumbs up? I think this might be one of my f all time favorite Star Trek episodes. Oh, wow. The performances by J.G. Oh, Hertzler really? and John Kalikos are incredible. I mean, oh. movie. They, this could have been in a movie, right? Yes. Shakespearean, yet grounded. I mean, I absolutely love this episode. I could go watch it again right now. Oh, yeah. The episode would be a 10 without the Esri Quark nonsense. Yeah. But that brings it down. This episode did not deserve that stupid little story. Yeah. But otherwise, amazing episode. Absolutely loved it. Agreed. I think any time you have actors who really get the characters that they are supposed to play, and don't just act the scene, <laughs> I feel they embrace the very nature of what they're supposed to be. Yeah. And it comes off just perfectly. You just believe them as these yeah. characters, regardless of how ridiculous they look in that makeup. It doesn't matter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. Well, that wraps up season seven, episode seven. Come back next week for episode eight, though. I don't know how we're going to top this episode. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. And there weren't even any profits in it. And we I'm still afraid it. it's all downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh, I hope that's not true. Uh, I'm going to say here, I don't think... Deep Space Nine ever jumped the shark. Somehow it did a reverse shark jump. It started <laughs> with the shark and then it got better after that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, come back next week for episode eight, whatever that may be. In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your own over analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com or tweet us at rebingeit. We're also on Instagram and YouTube at rebingeit. You can join the Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash groups slash Star Trek TTM podcasts. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. That's it for me. And that's it for me. Kapla.